Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Out in Equals 2018 October Town Call. My name is Ben Demers. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the senior associate here in Out in Equal University, and I'll be your host for today's call. The topic of this call is intersex awareness in the workplace, and we'll be discussing the state of people with intersex traits within the United States to sort of start to build awareness, and then we'll start to look at how companies can get involved in these efforts. Now, this is a topic that we have yet to really address in our webinar content, but it's one that we know more and more companies are beginning to talk about. So we really want to use this space here today to kind of explore how companies can more effectively engage. And so you'll be hearing on, uh, on today's call from two fantastic speakers from GE and from Interact Advocates, both of whom I'll be introducing in just a few moments. So before we get started, I want to go over some quick housekeeping items. This is a live broadcast audio call, meaning you should be able to access audio through your computers. If you're calling in through the phone, please just note that you'll not be able to hear the short video during one portion of this call. If you or your colleagues are having any difficulties logging in and cannot access the link used to register, let them know to sign in by going to readytalk.com, clicking Join a Meeting, and then using access code 6946521. During the call, we ask that you chat in questions for our presenters using the chat function, which they'll be answering at the Q&A period at the end of the call. And then afterwards, a recording of this presentation along with the slide deck used will also be made available for you to rewatch or to share amongst your networks. I also want to mention some upcoming dates to look for at Out in Equal. So our next town call will be held next month, and it will be looking at discussing best practices for non-binary inclusion in the workplace. On November 14th, we'll also be hosting a global webinar on exploring the global generational gap on LGBTQ workplace issues. And in terms of events, I know many of you joined us for our Workplace Summit and might still be tired from the week, but um, on November 29th and 30th, we'll be hosting our third Out in Equal Brazil Forum in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which seeks to advance really discussions around LGBTQ workplace equality in the country. So if your company has any operations in Brazil, we'd love to have them join us for that event. Now before beginning today's presentations, however, I do want to take a moment to talk about a really pertinent issue for all of our community, and that's actually the, the draft memo from the Trump administration that was released by the New York Times this past weekend, so, which looks at establishing a new legal definition of gender. And I've invited Out and Equals Research Manager, Madeline Jelpe, to tell you a bit more about what our organization is doing, and I'll let her take over from there. Thanks, Ben, and uh, welcome everyone to this call today. Um, as Ben mentioned, our organization is really um, engaging on a lot of different things uh, to ensure that we are, we are getting businesses on board um, in the hashtag won't be erased campaign. Um, as you all know, earlier this week the New York Times reported um, that the, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is leading an initiative to formalize a definition of sex, which um, is, is so narrow that it would um, essentially uh, erase our um, organization or the country's kind of recognition of transgender people. Um, there are a lot of different implications that this could have. Um, while the specific memo um, hasn't been released yet, uh, we, we are trying to ensure that people are engaging and that um, fight, we're all fighting as best we can um, to uh, mitigate any outcome that this potential uh, memo could have. So um, just some of the things that we are working on. Um, we, we posted a, a message from our CEO um, shortly after we learned of this news, as well as a uh, downloadable um, PDF tool to um, give businesses an idea of how they can engage in this issue. Um, as most of you know on the call, um, companies have uh, incredible impact and influence in this country. And um, the messages, the public statements that get put out uh, surrounding topics like this can really do a lot to, um, to change uh, what, what happens. And so what we're hoping to do, um, if uh, people are interested in getting involved in this campaign, I, I would invite you to please check out the um, tool we, we published on our website. Um, it's on the front page. Uh, if you go to our blog, uh, you can find this um, tool. And um, we're asking that folks who are interested, if your company is interested in any kind of um, coordinated response, we are gathering points of contact. So um, I'll post my email address in the chat uh, feature of this call so that you, if you do have someone who is interested in getting in touch with us, 
um, you can send them our way so that we can um, keep you updated about next steps. Um, we are working with several other um, LGBTQ nonprofits, uh, NCTE, NGLCC, the task force, HRC, um, and a number of different um, folks to, to ensure that we we're all um, on the same page and, and having a, a very effective response. So if you are interested, please get in touch with me um, and send me uh, contact information for strategic and coordinated public policy uh, folks in your companies, and we'll, we'll get them updated. And uh, yeah, uh, again, please check out the tool. I know that Kimberly is going to be talking about this a little bit more later in the call and how um, this uh, initiative could, could have major effects for the intersex community as well. Um, so uh, I'll let Kimberly talk about that um, in a little bit. But um, I appreciate the time uh, that you've given me today and, and hope to hear from those interested. Thanks, Ben. I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Madeline. And as Madeline mentioned, we'll be hearing a bit more about this memo later in the call from Kimberly and kind of the potential effects for the intersex community. And so now I'd like to shift back to our main topic of intersex awareness in the workplace and introduce you to our two speakers today. So we're joined by Kimberly Zieselman, the Executive Director of Interact Advocates, which is an organization that focuses on advancing the rights of people with intersex traits as well as by Debbie Cohen from GE Healthcare, who's been a longtime LGBTQ advocate um, and has also been engaged with some of GE's first intersex focus initiatives. And with that, I'll turn it over to Debbie. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to speak to you all today about diversity and inclusion and our approach and also how we're connecting with Kimberly and her team in the intersex community. So at GE, we like to talk about the power of the mix when we talk about inclusion with respect to our employees uh, in our communities. So we are a large company that is going through a fair amount of change. However, we are still focused on supporting our employees and communities around the world. Our company culture is such that for over 125 years, we create an environment where all employees can contribute and succeed with almost 300,000 employees working around the world in approximately 180 countries we are global and diverse and so we are centered on creating programs and opportunities so that everybody can contribute we'd like to take a moment just to share with you some of the history of inclusion and diversity at GE we have a strong history of employee engagement through our affinity networks. As we can see here on the timeline, our first network, the African American Forum, was started way back in 1991. A handful of employees got together and made it happen. They inspired the creation of our Women's Network, Hispanic Forum, and Asian and Pacific Islander Forum later on in the decade. As we evolved in our inclusion, G's Jilded with the Alliance, Veterans Network, and the People with Disabilities Networks were created. As we can see from the summaries of various groups, Each group has done well to provide a path for the professional development of employees in connecting to their respective communities. Any employee can be in many of them, any group, as we are all allies for each other. We'd like to take a moment to focus on our GLBT alliance. Those letters stand for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and ally. And certainly we know that as we continue to evolve, both within our company and as we evolve as a society throughout the world, that we're revisiting those letters and in, in how we make sure that everybody's included. For the last eight years, we've worked diligently to create a formal program for expanding our support for employees globally. We're proud to have grown from three countries in 2010, the US, Canada, and a great site through our former capital business in the Philippines, to now 38 in 2018. As you can see on the slide, we've developed a strong presence in Latin America, where every country with employees has a formal team. Continue to expand and support in Europe, where our focus is now on Eastern Europe. And this year, we were proud sponsor to be, or, sorry, proud to be a sponsor at the Gay Games in France. In Asia, we have strong teams in Japan and China, along with a strong internal presence in India. As we've grown, we've created leadership opportunities for employees via roles such as regional champion and country leader. 
and seeing a need to address specific aspects of our community, we've created community advocate roles for the bisexual and transgender communities, and most recently after meeting Kimberly, the intersex community. All of these roles have defined descriptions that outline strategic and tactical roles. We posted and open to all employees globally. We continue to evaluate uh, new countries and opportunities based on our employee metrics. Through our experience over the years, we've been able to create a templated process that centers on core teams executing on two tiers of pillars. So we can see that on tier one, professional development focused on attracting, developing, and retaining top talent, connecting to senior leadership, and building transferable skills for employees. Education, where we have standardized one-on-one -on -one content, now at workshops, along with the opportunity for employees in local countries to add in local culture and then a strong train the trainer program so that more and more employees can be trained to deliver that content. And then certainly community outreach is equally important, promoting, supporting local communities with time and funds, partnering across the affinity network, and building strong NGO partnerships. The tier two pillars have been developed as we've expanded globally, identifying what's important as uh, activities internal to the company with respect to our membership, supporting remote employees, identifying support from local leadership, strong senior leadership across the business, and building rigor into our launch process so that employee safety, which is our number one priority, is maintained wherever we support. Connecting with external companies is essential, whether it's in-country companies or multinationals. We benchmark and share best practices and share events. Even if we're competitors, the focus is on inclusion and diversity. NGO partnerships are equally important they provide us with education on local culture and local law, opportunities to network, create conferences such as Out in Equal Summit, uh, an executive forum and in country forums, access to education, and also create equality indices which we can participate in and be measured uh, on how well we provide our support. And then lastly, policy. This is where we partner internally with colleagues in the HR and labor and employment uh, legal counsel space, understanding fair uh, non-discrimination statements that impact employees globally, benefits that might be country specific, um, and also identifying how we work with the U.S. State Department, the U.N., uh, and various uh, countries abroad. Oops. So in particular, um, we'd like to thank IBM and Accenture for their extensive guidance and connections over the years. And the NGO support, which I mentioned, is key as well. So we're very thankful to Out and Equal for support and connections in the U.S. and abroad as we've expanded. And we'd like to thank, give thanks to Outright International team in New York City for their connecting with Interact so that we could cross paths at their annual Out Summit in celebration of Curtisland and make this connection and build a a strong community with Kimberly and her team. So thank you for allowing us to give that exposure uh, to our approach here at General Electric. And I'd like to hand it over to Kimberly. Hi, everyone. It's really my pleasure to be here. And um, I want to thank especially Debbie but uh, GE for being such a trailblazer in bringing the eye into the conversation with you all. Um, it's really, really time to do it, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. So first, just a couple of seconds about me. Who am I? Um, I was born intersex. I'm an intersex woman. Um, but the, the truth about my intersex status was hidden from me as a child, and I did not find out the truth until about 11 years ago um, when I got my medical records uh, and discovered that I, in fact, was born uh, intersex. It's become a new advocacy journey for me. Um, I already uh, was a lawyer and uh, an advocate working in nonprofit healthcare settings mostly. Um, for the past 25 years, and so it was sort of a perfect 
segue for me to start advocating for intersex children today and intersex people today who still, for the large part, are very much hidden in our society. So I'm now speaking out, and uh, this uh, slide just shows last year um, I wrote an op-ed. Uh, that's yes, a picture of me in high school as a cheerleader. Um, Kind of the point was to show sort of a typical quote unquote American girl from the suburbs, you know, out there um, and, and intersex and trying to raise awareness, particularly amongst sort of more of the moderate middle that perhaps wouldn't typically be aware of these types of gender or sex non conforming uh, issues. So that was uh, in USA Today last summer. And I have been the executive director and with Interact for almost six years. So Interact's mission is to is really focused on um, protecting the rights of intersex children and protecting them from the human rights abuses that are happening to them on their bodies without their consent. We're the first organization of its of its kind in North America, um, founded about 11 years ago and really growing in the last couple of years. We're actually the largest intersex advocacy organization in the world, with just six full-time staff. Uh, last year, if you had talked to me, I would have said three full-time staff. So it was, we're really growing rapidly now, finally. Um, we're all working remotely from home offices on the East and West Coast, and our entire budget is under uh, $500,000. So it just kind of gives you a sense of how small we are, despite being the largest intersex advocacy organization in the world. We do legal and policy advocacy, as well as media and awareness raising work as well as intersex youth leadership development. Those are sort of the three buckets of work that we do, and they all relate to each other. Um, our youth program now has over 60 uh, intersex young people from all over the world. This uh, slide uh, shows many of their faces. So to start with the basics, let's just define intersex. Um, intersex refers to someone who is born with one or more sex characteristics, so physical sex characteristics, that don't match up with what we typically think of as either a male or a female body. Um, it's truly an umbrella term that refers to a diverse number of experiences and conditions. I'll talk a little bit about that, but I want you to keep in mind that it is a very, very diverse uh, term. So just because you meet one intersex person or perhaps because you hear my story doesn't mean you know everything there is to know about intersex. Certainly um, experiences can vary greatly. It can be apparent at birth, which is perhaps the most uh, commonly known um, situation when a baby is born with usually uh, genitalia that doesn't look like what the doctors or parents are expecting, either a baby girl or a baby boy to look like. That happens about one in 2,000 births. But it can also happen at puberty, when puberty starts to go a direction that or, or not happen at all. Um, and attempting pregnancy, sometimes um, men or women can discover their intersex traits upon examination at that point in their lives, and sometimes people go to their graves and have been actually discovered in history um, after their death on autopsy to have been intersex. So just to give you a little concrete, some concrete examples, I'll talk about myself first. Um, as I said, I am an intersex woman with uh, complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. So that is a medical term that uh, describes my sex characteristics as being born with XY chromosomes. So I have XY chromosomes, which are typically thought of as male. And otherwise, I phenotypically on the outside appear feminine. So my intersex traits were not discovered until puberty when I didn't go, uh, go through a typical female puberty and went to the doctor and had tests done. Um, it was discovered I had XY chromosomes and also that I had internal testes instead of ovaries or uterus or fallopian tubes. Um, however, I was told that I had partially formed female reproductive organs and uh, told that it, they would become cancerous if I didn't have them all removed urgently. So I was rushed to surgery that summer after the school year ended and um, in fact, that was not true. Um, I had no higher risk of cancer than anyone else. Um, 
in my condition uh, with testes, even though they were undescended, the um, the risk of cancer is very, very, very low. In fact, it's lower than a typical woman without a family history of breast cancer's chance of getting breast cancer, right? And we don't go around taking off little girls' breasts. So um, nonetheless, that's what happened to me. And there were, you know, I've suffered physical and psychological harms as, uh, as a result. I'll give you a couple more quick examples. My friend Jim um, also has XY chromosomes. He has partial androgen sensitivity syndrome. He was assigned female and was operated on as a child. They basically removed his phallus because they didn't think it looked male enough. Jim suffered greatly and uh, started living his, his true self um, in his young 20s and today lives, lives uh, as a male. My friend Janet has uh, XX chromosomes, so what you typically think of isn't a, is a female. Um, but when she was born, as very typical of women with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, one of the more common intersex conditions, her clitoris was larger than typical, and so it was uh, reduced. It was operated on and uh, pretty much mutilated, is how she'll describe it, um, as a child, simply not out of medical necessity, but to make it look more normal. So those experiences are, are real people that I know, and they're just, you know, two of the of the hundreds and hundreds of people I've met, this is these surgeries are happening without intersex people's consent um, all over the world and all over this country. And I'm sitting in New York City right now with a few hospitals that are doing at least one surgery probably this week, if not more. So this is real. Um, so congratulations because you have intersex employees in your workforce. Workforce. Um, you have intersex employees, and you also very likely have employees who are or may someday become parents of intersex children. So I think it's really important, and I'm really happy that you all are here um, learning about this to be able to support your employees. Statistically, we're really not that rare. I like to say we're just invisible. Nearly 2% of the population is born with an intersex trait. And, and that's like the same roughly as natural born redheads or people born with green eyes. And it's actually more common than identi natural identical twin births. So why hasn't everyone heard more about intersex before? Um, you know, the, the really simple answer, but it's very true, is that shame and stigma has kept people in the closet for a long time. The shame and stigma imposed on them by society um, and then some people like myself were never told and only discovered later in life. And mostly, so, you know, medicine, society and medicine have been trying to erase us by fixing our bodies to fit into these binary boxes of either male or female. So what I'd like to do next is um, show you a six-minute video that was produced by Interact in partnership with Human Rights Watch last year after we worked together on a year-long research and report project, uh, the first ever that documented the intersex human rights abuses that are happening here in the U.S. in medical settings. Um, I think this is a really great way to illustrate the key, the key issue, so I wanted to take the time to show it to you today. And hopefully, I'm gonna push the right button. The first kind of indication was um, we had an ultrasound, had an ultrasound and they said, you know, you're having a little girl. So we you know, picked out girl names and we kind of prepared for that. But one of the last ultrasounds that we had, the, the OBGYN said, well, you know, you might actually be having a little boy. Um, and he said, you know, ultrasounds aren't that accurate. And so it's, it's probably nothing, not to worry. But when she was born, right away the OB said, um, there's something that I don't, I don't know how to explain. Intersex means that the internal genitalia, the external genitalia, the chromosomes, the hormones, and the person's physical appearance don't look or correspond to classically male or classically female. For many decades, the standard of care for intersex newborns included surgical procedures to make them look as typically female or typically male as possible. Some doctors tell parents that these surgeries will make their child's body look like a typical boy or a typical girl. 
but these surgeries can have devastating consequences for the kids that can last a lifetime. We spoke to parents who told us they felt intense pressure from doctors to consent to surgeries even when those operations were medically unnecessary. We wanted to make sure she got to see, you know, the best specialists and the best providers who could, you know, give us the answers and it was disheartening. We left feeling like we were on an island, you know, with, with very little support. And while we were confident enough to not proceed with the surgery, I would be lying if I said we didn't have a lot of doubt about, oh my gosh, like they've told us all these awful things. Are we doing the wrong thing by our kid? Parents talked about feeling bombarded with scary and confusing information. For instance, doctors told parents that if they chose not to have surgery on their kid, their kid would be bullied at school. However, a claim like that has never been substantiated in medical literature. It's common that the discussion will be about how successful those surgeries can be, how safe those surgeries can be, and how well they can work in helping the child fit in. Uh, what they don't include still, for the most part, are discussions of the potential harms. These surgeries carry the risk of scarring and nerve damage, infertility, incontinence, loss of sexual sensation and function, and the need to be on lifelong hormone replacement therapy. I found out I was intersex. Freshman year, I retrieved my medical records, and I learned not only was I intersex, but then I learned everything they did to me to try to take the intersex parts of me away. It was like getting the wind knocked out of me. When I was first born, doctors found undescended testes in my abdomen and removed them. When I was four years old, the surgeons decided to reduce the size of my clitoris. I had no knowledge of this. When I was 11, they said they were doing surgery on my bladder. And when I found out from my medical records, that was actually a non-consensual vaginoplasty. When these irreversible surgeries are conducted on children, they can have a lifelong physical impact as well as psychological trauma. When intersex kids grow up, they may want some of these operations, but that should be their decision to make. Physicians are very powerful in this equation. The medical saying, do no harm, plays a prominent role in care for intersex individuals. We need to really think about the fact that there is a significant risk for harm. There are two very rare instances when surgery is required on a newborn with a variance of sex development. One is when the internal organs are on the outside of the body as if they were turned inside out. The other one would be to ensure that there's a place for urine to leave the body. Any other surgical procedure on the external genitalia of a newborn is cosmetic surgery and is not medically necessary. Doctors across the U.S. continue to conduct medically unnecessary irreversible surgeries on intersex children when the kids are far too young to consent and when the operations could be safely deferred until the kids are old enough to decide for themselves. These surgeries need to stop. I think our daughter is the best the best evidence for why surgery should be deferred because she's she's awesome right after she was born i um i got to spend a little time with her before she went to the incubator and i remember i kept saying to her like i hope you're all right i hope you're all right and everybody was telling us all the things that were wrong with her and that was so hard to hear as a parent but i feel like these last Two and a half years, she's been doing nothing but proving to us that she's all right. I wish my parents would have known that I would grow up and not want this to have happened to me. I wish they would have known that when the doctors came to them saying, your kid basically won't be lovable unless we change their vagina, change this, change that, take their clitoris out, et cetera, et cetera, they, that they would have let that bounce off and know, no. Like, if my daughter's not sick, then you're not going to try to change her so that she could be loved. She should be loved for who she is. <laughs> Great, thank you.
Um, I hope you all feel that was informative and helpful. I, I really think that video does a great job at, at explaining the core issue. Um, it also gets me emotionally every single time that dad starts crying. These are real issues that some of your employees may be facing as parents um, or may have faced as, as young people um, themselves. So I'm going to get into uh, in a few more slides a little bit more specifically about what you can do <clears throat> as employees and as employers, corporate employers, but I want to just uh, talk a little bit more generally about the intersex movement. The last couple of years, intersex visibility has been increasing greatly. Um, Interact partnered with um, internationally renowned fashion model Hannah Gabby Odiel, um, who herself is intersex and came to us a few years ago and we partnered with her to, to uh, work with her to come out and it really raised, it gave us a platform that we didn't have before to talk about these issues. She's still advocating today. In fact, I'm going to be going from here to a, a panel at NYU where she's speaking with some other young intersex people. Um, tonight and we also ended up doing a lot more media as a result like uh, with Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue has a great series of short videos that they did with Hana and a couple of our intersex activists. It's just their conversations and Q&A and they're really, really informative. Um, we also were um, contacted by, oops, not, not advancing. Oh. Sorry, slide advancing. Um, we were also contacted by GLAAD um, a few years ago to consult with their creation of the first ever intersex character on a television show for young people called Faking It. It was a show about LGBT and I teens, um, and it was a really cool opportunity for us and for our youth members to, to get involved from reviewing scripts and coaching them on language to telling our own stories so they could be reflected back in this character. Um, and also down to one of our youth members who is now our on staff full-time youth program manager. In this slide, you can see them in this picture. One episode, they actually played an Interact Youth member in the episode. So unfortunately, that show was canceled after three seasons, but it was uh, really, it was the first time there was a main character on TV that was intersex, and um, they did it the right way by, by consulting the intersex community. Um, which does not always happen, as I'm sure you know. So, can you stop for me? Sorry. Thank you. So, I want to talk a little bit about why does the I, or why does intersex belong in LGBTQI? Um, and I think this is probably a, a big issue that um, you've all thought about when, when attending this webinar, understandably. And I want to talk a little bit about why I think and why Interact thinks the I does belong as part of this broader queer community. Um, while it's not a sexual orientation or even an identity necessarily, intersex people share very common experiences of oppression and discrimination, similarly based on the fear of difference, right? In the case of intersex folks, it's bodily difference. Intersex erasure, I believe, is firmly rooted in homophobia. Like LGB and T movements, we protest our realities being reduced to disorders. The LGBTQ plus identities have long been pathologized as mental disorders. Homosexuality won its way out of the uh, DSM, the medical uh, diagnosis, in 1973, but being trans was just declassified by the World Health Organization's manual this year. And today, intersex people are still reduced to physical disorders by the medical institutions will refer to people with disorders of sex development. Intersex surgeries are really much like gay conversion therapy. It's an attempt to erase the intersex parts of us. And so that's why I think intersex really does have a lot of similarities with the broader um, experiences of the broader LGBTQ community. However, we also obviously have unique differences that need to be understood. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about something that just happened this week. Um, as you all know, the Trump administration's attempt to erase um, 
well, or raise trans and intersex people, really, and to um, propose a binary restrictive definition of both gender and sex. That obviously shook us up, um, and we've been uh, interact, uh, myself and others at Interact have been collaborating with um, leaders in the community as well as with our trans peers um, on this. There, you know, as you probably know, the, 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 the memo says that the administration is suggesting that um, using chromosomes should be, you know, the determining factor um, when, there's, when there's uncertainty. And, you know, that not only erases trans people, but many intersex folks like myself as well. So despite the fact that at least the way the New York Times reported it on Sunday, this supposed leaked memo that I don't think anybody's seen yet, didn't mention intersex per se, but what they were really talking about would impact many intersex people as well. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about that. Some of the media has been picking, other media has been picking up on that fact. One of our um, youth leaders, one of our youth members, she's one of our superstars, wrote a um, op-ed that was published yesterday in the New York Times. So if you haven't, if you didn't see it, I would suggest checking it, checking it out. Um, so I just want to summarize a few things before we get into the specifics of what you can do. Um, just to summarize what we're talking about, we're talking about human rights abuses in medical settings on intersex children, you know, based on the fear of bodily difference and society's attempt to fix us and place us in binary boxes and essentially erase us. This is despite the documented physical and psychological harms. The physical harms include need for repeated surgeries, loss of sensation, painful scarring, lifelong dependence on hormone replacement therapy, and even sterilization, loss of fertility. And, and this is all done without the person's consent, which is really the key. Therefore, the psychological harms, which I think sometimes can be worse, um, involve issues of trust and intimacy and relationships, depression, anxiety, trauma, and even PTSD similar to sexual violence survivors. These are caused by repeated genital exams, multiple doctors and residents examining intersex children and young adults, genital photography, the use of hurtful language in medical settings, and the perpetuating lies and secrets. But I'm happy to say we are fighting back there is a global community, in fact, fighting back. Um, there are ad activists, intersex activists now in many, many, many countries. This picture here is showing um, the largest group to assemble in, um, at once in uh, Amsterdam last year. It was the fourth uh, international intersex forum. It represented, it was the most diverse, and it represented all the major regions of the world, which is what was really exciting about, about this year, or about that year's conference. Um, so there are a growing number of activists who are connected all online and uh, working together on um, international human rights issues and very often collaborating, kind of using the international framework, uh, human rights framework available to us and advising each other and sharing information and tactics from country to country. But as you can imagine, like many other, like other LGBTQ issues, uh, the cultural differences and the language barriers can be really challenging, but this is something that our community is um, very much committed to. And if any of you are listening and in, in, in another country and would like to connect with somebody in your country, feel free to reach out to me and I will do my best to connect you. Um, so like I said, this is a human rights issue. In 2013, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture did a study and a report on tor torture on healthcare settings and deemed these genital surgeries to be, in fact, torture in healthcare settings. I remember being really excited when that happened. I thought this is going to make a huge difference. You know, the, the world is going to hear about this. This is going to put the spotlight on the surgeons and the urologists and the endocrinologists that are primarily the specialties, still very, very much committed to, to doing these surgeries. And, and it didn't. It, it, it angered them. And they, they pretty much ignored it. Um, then in 2015, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights specifically included intersex rights in his opening statement 
at the Human Rights Council. And in the same year, uh, the office called on states specifically to prohibit medically unnecessary surgery and procedures on the sex characteristics of intersex children to protect their physical integrity and respect their autonomy. That year, the UN Free and Equal Campaign also published an excellent two-page intersex fact sheet, which is available online. I, I highly recommend that. And then a year later, they launched uh, a website with videos and testimonials from intersex people that I also highly, highly recommend. So moving on to how to support intersex employees and parents who are employees. Part of the reason we're facing, I think, such significant human rights abuses is because a lot, because there is a lack of awareness that this population even exists still, not to mention the misguided conception that if we do exist, our bodies are somehow broken. This is part of why we're so grateful to the UN for including us in the free and equal global business standards. A key to changing this paradigm is making explicit in company materials that your organization does not just recognize the 1.7% of your workforce that is intersex, but it celebrates them in the same way it celebrates and supports other types of diversity. So what does this look like in practice? First and foremost, just don't just slap on the eye and consider things done, right? If, if discussion um, of our experiences isn't actually included in your efforts to promote equity, then it isn't meaningful inclusion. Reach out to intersex-led organizations like Intersex Interact and others to thoughtfully include intersex in your diversity, equity, and inclusion programming so that you don't leave out this important population. And by listening to this webinar, you are already taking in a very, very, very important first step. But more concretely, let me just read number one, ensure any equity and inclusion policies and activities are intersex affirming. If you have a non-discrimination policy, even if it does not yet include intersex explicitly, it likely includes some combination of sex and gender as protected characteristics. So any policy that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex characteristics, also known as intersex. So ideally, including expressly including intersex people is, is the best option. But what I'm saying here is if you have policies that protect from di discrimination on the basis of sex, you're already very arguably protecting intersex people. That's certainly what our, our, what our lawyers would argue. It's important to take this into account when doing any training or providing any guidance around your policy. So number two, um, educate others. Inform future parents that intersex medical interventions are usually unnecessary and should not occur until an individual can participate in the decision. For many years, medicine viewed healthy intersex babies as right needing to be fixed. Um, the vast majority of surgeries, as I said, are not medically necessary and should be delayed until the person themselves can have a say. Some families report being told that surgery was necessary only to find out later that it wasn't. It's a very confusing, confusing time for parents. So supporting parents as, as such would be really, really um, another uh, thing that you can do as uh, an employer and making sure that they have the resources that they need. And three, just make sure your health insurance is not reimbursing for what's been deemed a form of torture by international human rights organizations. While doctors may be thinking that they're acting with the best intentions, rushing to fix an intersex child body doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. It does more harm than good, as I've been saying. Um, so I know we're running out of time here. I just wanted the next couple of slides are real quick. I just wanted to mention that tomorrow is Intersex Awareness Day, which um, is an international day. This is, I believe, the 21st International, uh, international Intersex Awareness Day. Um, what you can do is follow, interact, and share on social media. Um, Human Rights Campaign and other big LGBT orgs have been and continuing have and are continuing to join, interact, and um, lifting up intersex issues on this day. It's a really good hook to start talking about it or even just to share it with employees. Um, hashtag 
for Intersect or hashtag Intersect Awareness Day. Let's see how many companies we can get to tweet out tomorrow. Um, these are just some helpful tips. Don't make assumptions. Let intersex people tell their own stories. As I've said, intersex is different from gender or sexual orientation. Like anyone, intersex people can have any orientation or identity. And while it's not the same as being LGBT, there are similarities, especially in experiences around oppression and discrimination. So in conclusion, we, we really need your help as allies um, in the queer community. We need our friends to join us in the fight for intersex rights. Um, one thing you can do is go to fourintersex.org um, where we have more resources and you can easily sign up to be on our mailing list. Um, we promise not to bombard you. And another way to support us is by giving to Interact. Um, asking your employer if they do employer matching, it's an easy way to, and it makes a huge difference to us. Um, so I want to leave room for questions. So thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, and I think I'm going to turn it back to Debbie and then we're going to do questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kimberly. <laughs> Exceptional awareness and education um, for all of us who are coming up to speed on the intersex community. So we just wanted to take one last slide from a corporate standpoint of how we engage our community um, in, the, in the business environment. So this is an example of what we're doing at GE. So we've got um, four sections here on what we would do. So first, uh, I mentioned before, NGO partners are crucial to help educate us back. So Kimberly and the Interact team are the partner for, for getting started. As she mentioned, you can go to her website and start making contact with them and take a look at their education materials. And then for us, we've decided that some communities require a specific champion. And so that's where we've created this intersex champion where I mentioned they have strategic and tactical goals. We made it with essentially the job description. Like many of you, we're all volunteers in this space. We have day jobs. Um, but this is important enough, and we do have an ally who's taken that on for us uh, in the last few months. And so um, that person is going to be facing externally with the NGO, other companies, and then bringing back and creating that education content for us and trainers and making sure that that's in our vernacular and our everyday speech community. And then the policy standpoint, Kimberly was just talking about our fair employment practices, um, benefits. We need to understand how those are working in our company, both here in the U.S. and abroad. We know they can differ from country to country when it comes to the benefits especially. And so that's where we look to work with our, our partners in our ERGs, in our affinity networks, HR sponsors, labor and employment legal counsel, um, getting executive leadership engagement. Um, from an ex that's internal policy. From an external policy standpoint, We've seen a large influx of companies over the last few years, and I'm more especially in the U.S. with filing or being partners on amicus briefs um, that have been filed either at the federal or state level uh, against anti-discrimination policies or speaking out against um, potential laws that may be discriminatory to various uh, segments of our community. And so I know how that impacted us internally was to start to get together a team. Those are people in the legal space government relations and so forth that uh, look to put together templated processes so that we can more quickly react. Uh, and so I just wanted to share, those are some of the steps that are active in what we're taking. Um, from a funding standpoint, NGOs need funding and, and these corporations need to create our budgets and you now consider at, adding Interact to support the intersex community um, as we go into our 2019 uh, budgets, and then from an employee level, um, for example, we have the GE Foundation, and so each employee in the U.S. Um, and the U.K. can have matching funds for any registered nonprofit, and so we've already set them up over the summer uh, so that our, our donations as individuals um, will be matched one-to-one uh, -one for that. All right, so I'll stop there and then hand it back to Ben. All right, thank you both so much for those presentations. And so we do still have some time on now for, for questions. Um, so the first one I'm seeing, I think that this is probably best for Debbie, but also uh, Kimberly, if you want to chime in. So asking, other than my LGBTQ ERG, are there other ERGs that you recommend engaging around intersex awareness at your company? 
Yeah, um, it's, it's a great question. Um, thank you for asking it. Kimberly and I were have been discussing that. And in, in really, any ERG that you have at your company um, should be involved in the intersex community. Um, intersex applies to individuals across um, all, you know, internal and external flavors, if I may say, um, that we are. And then also, um, we see growing, uh, even in the classical LGBT sense, um, parents of children who are growing up and starting to identify, we definitely want to include the intersex community in that and help guide parents um, through that as well. So the answer is all. Okay, great, thank you. I'm just having a quick technical issue here. Um, but Debbie, if you want to check, uh, and you can see the next question coming up. So we're just scrolling back through the beginning. So here, uh, another question was, what are some of the biggest mis misconceptions that people have about intersex people, and how do we combat them? So that's actually a great question. And it makes me realize that I didn't talk enough about um, the really uh, common conflation between intersex and trans. Um, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that, uh, first of all, intersex is an identity or it's a choice. Um, it's not. Um, it's, it's, you know, I was born this way, baby, kind of thing. <laughs> it just is what it is. Um, and I think what's confusing and understandably confusing is that some people in the intersex community are assigned a sex and a gender that doesn't match who they are or are even surgically assigned uh, a gender, right, by changing their genitals, for example. And so they end up um, later in life sometimes choosing to live a different gender than they were raised. And so some intersex people also identify as transgender. Um, so that is a very, very common misconception and, and um, confusion for folks, understandably. Um, otherwise, I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is just either conflating us with trans or thinking that all intersex people um, also identify as LGB um, or T, and although many, many do, not all do. So I think those, were, those are sort of the two big things that pop to mind. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have another question here asking, and so this can be both within company self-ID practices, but also in other places. Should intersex be an option in self-ID, so in self-identification collection, um, as an option? I'll take that. I think, I think it should be, um, but I would encourage you to consult with Interact or with other intersex uh, um, people, other intersex people, other intersex orgs about how to do that. Um, we're getting this question a lot lately, particularly as um, if there seems to be an increased interest um, in research, thankfully, and uh, clinical research and medical research to do this um, to to uh, ask these questions as part of their research initiatives. I think the key is um, to not just include it as another gender, um, because it isn't, and that's what a lot of people tend to do. They think, well, if we also put down an I or an intersex along with male or female. Um, another misconception, this goes back to the last question I was commenting on, I'm just realizing is, a lot of people think intersex is the same as a non-binary gender identity. And that's understandable because intersex is what, you know, the word literally means between the sexes. And so you think, well, that's, that's sort of like in between or non-binary. Um, but that's, that's not true. Some intersex people do identify as non-binary, but that's only um, um, a proportion of them. Great, thank you. 
Um, we have another question here asking directly, does Interact have any draft or recommended anti-discrimination language that could be utilized by corporations? Uh, we could certainly consult on that, yes. Uh, we don't ha I don't have any templates or anything readily available for you, but that is something that our attorneys um, do think and talk about a lot in terms of legislation. In fact, we were successful in getting Health and Human Services right before uh, right before Obama left to uh, put out in their regulations specifically that intersex was included um, under sex discrimination for purposes of anti-discrimination protections in the uh, health care act. So, you know, that's obviously going to be undone by this administration, but that's the type of work we're doing that also, you know, translates very well, obviously, over into corporate policy. So um, please reach out and we'll see what we can do to, to help. Perfect, thank you. And so I know we're and we're uh, nearing the end of our time here today. Um, so I do want to thank both of our presenters. I know there are still a number of questions left. And so um, both in that earlier slide where you can see the contact information for Interact, but also um, we'll make sure that all of those extra questions get to the presenters and that they're connected with you and so you can really learn more about these initiatives. Um, so I want to say thank you again to Kimberly and Debbie for being with us today. Um, a reminder also that a recording of today's presentation along with the slide deck and a few additional resources that uh, Interact has put together will be sent out after the call. And also please don't forget to fill out the survey at the end of the call. Your feedback is really important to us as we're shaping these webinars for you in the future. Um, and with that, thank you to our presenters and we hope to see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.